good day. I'm Forster, Sir John Forster, Middle March Warden. Here we are. Middle of the Middle March is just about as inhospitable and violent a tract as you'll ever come across. That's why they made me Warden, of course. This is Harbottle, or Herebottle Castle, the Warden's seat in the Middle March. It's been here a long time. This place probably goes back to the old days of the anglo saxons where it was called Clear Bottle, which I think apparently means some form of garrison. But the family name most associated with this whole area are the Umfravilles, the great Anglo-Norman family. They were the Lords of Reedsdale for generations. Now the talk is that the original Umfraville came across to England with William the Conqueror and fought at the Battle of Hastings. And indeed the family had a land grant assigned, in theory, by William I, dated oh, a couple of years after Hastings itself. Whether they came then or later, we can't really say, but they've been here a long time. Not just here in Harbottle, they started with their great Mott and Bailey castle in Elsdon down the road. Now, Mott and Bailey, of course, is a, is a timber castle. It's built around the idea of a courtyard, a bailey, which has a wooden palisade, and then there's this conical hill uh, risen above the level of the bailey which contains the mot or the keeper, a wooden tower, a tower of last resort really. So that was pretty much how it was at Elson when the Umfravilles first set up shop there. Then, on the orders of Henry II, and he wasn't the sort of man you, whose orders you question, they moved their Cokerdale headquarters, their Cokerdale base, here to Harbottle. And again, originally, this castle would have been built in timber. Now, as you see when we look around, we are standing on top of what would have been the Norman Mott, a wooden tower built on top of this man-made mound. The whole purpose was to defend Cokerdale against incursions from the Scots. The Scots were constantly raiding across the border, had to be said we were pretty much constantly raiding back across the border, and the Umfravilles were one of the leading names in the Thunder. Nobody heard of the Percys at that date, I have to say. Of course, the Percys eventually took over the whole of the Umfraville estates, traditious marriage, and the Tailbois family came into ownership of the castle until they sold it to the Crown a generation or so back, which is how I, as the Warden, come to be here. But as you can see, if you look beyond the walls of the castle, this is a pretty wild region, and the road to Scotland is directly up the valley. For centuries, this was then a great bulwark against the Scots. It resisted a siege in 1174 when the Scottish King William the Lion, he came south to punish the Umprevilles, who also had estates in Scotland, uh, because of some quarrel with him as King of Scots. Pretty rough bunch of the Scots, then as now. They took the entire population of Warkworth, herded them into the church there, St Lawrence's Church, and burnt the church down with the population still in it. But they couldn't take the great Umfravilles castle at Prado down the road, down the Tyne Valley, nor could they take this. They instead decided to lay siege to Anik, and the king with his army uh, was bivouacked by the walls of this castle, when out of the blue and out of the mist one summer's morning, the Umfravilles and the English borderers came rattling through, dispersed the Scottish army and took the king prisoner. So William the Lion was now William the Pussycat. He was dragged down south to meet Henry II, where he had to bend his knee and swear loyalty as his feudal subject to the King of England. Now this was an old refrain. Kings of England had exercised nominal control over Kings of Scotland since the great days of King Athelstan back in the 10th century. Oft be times the claim had been repeated. Malcolm Canmore, Shakespeare's Malcolm, had bent his knee to William the Conqueror in 1072. Again, in 1174, William the Lion bent his knee. Now, that might have been that. Didn't really matter that much. Nobody's that bothered. Until a century later, on dark and stormy night in February 1286, King Alexander III of Scotland, anxious to do his dynastic duty by his 13-year-old wife, Yolanda of Dreux, stumbled, full of drink they say, and had a fatal fall from his horse on the Fife shoreline. That left Scotland without a king. The infant child, who was designated as his heir, died on the way from Norway. And the kingdom, as kingdoms always do when there's no strong king, began to shake to its foundations as the great families began to fight among themselves. The Scots asked King Edward I of England, the dead king's brother in law, Longshanks, to intervene. And he, after a long process, elected John Balliol as King of Scotland. 
the price, quite simply put. And all the candidates had been queuing up to fall in with Edward's scheme was that he too, Balliol, had to swear allegiance to the King of England. The Scots came to rather resent this. Edward was a bit heavy-handed, to be sure. War broke out in 1296. Edward stormed Berwick. He burnt the town down around the inhabitants' ears, and it was said, by the Scots anyway, that he killed 7,000 of them. Probably an exaggeration, probably nearer 6,000. And that kicked off three centuries of border warfare. A new breed of official, the March Warden, local governors appointed by the Crown, came into being to manage these troublesome areas. And I'm the latest in a very long line of Middlemarch Wardens. They say there's no villainy on my, ward on my march, well, at least none that I haven't already authorised. And this now is the seat of my power. The Umprevilles, however, held it for centuries before me. They fought off the Scots. Eventually, Robert the Bruce insisted that this place be pulled down, that it be slighted. It was sort of demolished and then very quickly rebuilt. What did happen was that the Bailey, this area beyond, shrank and became smaller, and a straight diagonal wall was constructed. So instead of being a full circle, the Bailey is now effectively a half circle, with the keep still here on this mound. The keep, what we can see of it, is what I believe is termed a shell keep. It's not a building with a roof, it's a series of buildings which shelter behind an encircling stone wall. So it's like a castle within a castle, but of course it dominates the whole site. And from here, as you can see, you have a tremendous eagle's eye view over the whole of this countryside. Any army wishing to pass down from Upper Coquetdale into the fertile and immensely rich area south, river in the south part of the river valley, has to come through here. This is the cork in the bottle. If you hold Harbottle, then you hold the whole of Coquetdale. If you hold Coquetdale, you hold the marches. It's as simple as that. I think you find those in the south have never really heard of the great castle at Harbottle, but it's probably one of the most important of all the border castles, one of the most important in England. The big problem is persuading the Crown to pay for it. Year after year it falls steadily and further into ruin. The locals have a habit of stealing stone to build their own dwellings. As a warden, it's a big part of my job simply trying to keep place wind and water tight, then might keep the Scots out. Still, I'm luckier than my predecessor, Lord Dacre, Bull Dacre, great man Bull Dacre. He effectively secured the British victory, the English victory at Flodden, where we killed King James IV. A great day for England, not such a good day for Scotland, uh, but there was a rather unfortunate sequel as far as Dacre was concerned here as Warden of the March, he was obliged to entertain the late King of Scotland's widow, Margaret Tudor, who was, of course, the sister of the English King, Henry VIII. Uh, she'd been regent in Scotland after James's death, but then, having contracted another and perhaps rather unfortunate marriage to the Douglas, uh, was obliged to basically run for her life, and she came here, and was here for some time, where and by his own account, she made Dacre's life an absolute living hell, insisting on luxuries, insisting on the finest silks imported from France, as if she were not actually an exile living in a miserable border fortress. But the hard thing today is to conjure up an image of what this place looked like in my day and indeed before. What you see before you is a ruin, but you have to imagine it reconstructed, risen, as it were, from the dead. And this place was a township in itself. It would be full of people. The lords of Reesdale, the Umphervilles, were served on bended knee by their servants, yet they were on first name terms with those same servants, because the social gulf between one and the other was so vast it could never actually be surmounted. There would be a population of dozens, if not hundreds, in this place. Men, women and children. Not a big garrison, maybe a dozen men at arms, twenty archers, a couple of knights. But of course there'll be many of their dependents, there'll be many servants, there'll be many locals who might press themselves and their livestock into the old outer bailey in times of trouble. The Onfrevilles were very active in campaigns against the Scots, all the way through the Scots War in the reign of Edward I and indeed Edward III, the Onfrevilles were at the very forefront. So many a time there would be English armies mustering here to march north and do battle against the Scots. The Umprevilles, as Lords of Breedsdale, well, they had a fair bit of power. They were, they were largely independent of direct interference by the Crown. Kings like Edward I, of course, were always trying to interfere, but the Umprevilles exercised real lordship over this area. They were frontier lords, marcher lords. This place was so wild, so untamed, it needed strong men to manage it. It needed strong men to keep the Scots 
in check. Now, of course, let us have a word, shall we, with Queen Margaret Tudor. Here we have Her Majesty Queen Margaret of Scotland. She is, of course, as I mentioned, the sister of our own King Henry VIII, and um, some of us would say she shares a very similar temperament, haughty in the extreme. Well, madam, how do you do in our bottle? Well, you have let this place go to rack and ruin, haven't you? <sighs> My brother and you. Well, we do the best we can. I mean, I'm able to get some things in. Silks. Uh, 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 yes, madam, at whose expense, may I inquire? The expense is on the English crown, I think, is it not? Absolutely. And you are queen no, of? Yes, well, send the invoice to my brother. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, well, I'm afraid your brother has a certain track record where paying for his own repairs is concerned. Yes, well, one does have to invoke a little filial piety in this. You I think... Speak when you're spoken to. I think the king, if I am our king, has magnanimously agreed not to interfere in the estate's affairs of Scotland since we had the uh, good fortune, sorry, we, we suffered, we were obliged to kill your husband at Flodden. Didn't like him much anyway. <sighs> no, that much is obvious. I identified his body, you know. Nice one. Yes. He was dead, obviously. Yeah, he was dead. And we uh, sent his head down to the king. And we also oh, sent his surcoat, well. his surcoat, which was covered in his own blood, rather stylish, I thought. We sent that to the regent, yes, Catherine I of Aragon. do the repairs on that. She bundled it up and sent it out to King Henry in France, saying, this is evidence of the great victory that I have won for you in Scotland. And you, my darling, in France, you've... Um... Exactly what have yes. you done? Uh, it, all, it all comes down to the ladies, really. I think that could explain why they're getting divorced, of course. Well, yes, there was, there was that Berlin girl. She had a lot to do with it. Mm. You, well, cheer up, will you? As long as she doesn't lose her head. Now, here we've got a, a good view of what is actually the east wall. This is the wall that was built when the bailey was shrunk from its original extent to its later extent. Of course, you also see how impressive is the mot itself. Here, we can see how formidable the defences are on the northern flank. That way, of course, is Scotland. The river winds down below the hill and the natural defences created by the slope have been improved by the digging of ditches. So this is really an immensely strong position, something we don't really get an impression of today because it's deteriorated so much. But you have to imagine these walls would be at least another 10 feet higher. And in times of strife, they would be covered with wooden hoardings, the hoardings there to protect the defenders from enemy arrows. The whole place would bristle and the great banners of the Umfravers would be flaunting from every wall. And this was the site the Scots uh, would have to contend with in the course of their many invasions. And the garrison would be geared to holding out. Every man, woman and child would be ready to do their bit. Men would fight. The smiths would be labouring constantly to, remain to repair armour, to straighten out damage to weapons. The fletchers and bowyers would be busy turning out arrows and bows. The women would be carrying spare bows. Even the children would be carrying supplies to the walls. The whole garrison would be on a defensible basis. So this place would teem like a mini city. And perhaps even there might be a palisade re-erected around the old bailey if all the local people uh, with their cattle and sheep were sheltering from the invaders. And of course the castellan, the Umfervilles, would charge people for sheltering from the invader. It wasn't a free service. Nothing was free in the borders. And this is how it continued. This is how Harbottle stood for centuries as a bulwark against the Scots. It still does now even in the toward the end of the 16th century when our glorious Queen Elizabeth sits on the throne. She's very different to her father but I have to say she's just about as parsimonious if not rather worse. And at some point there will be peace with Scotland. Perhaps when James, Scotland, James VI becomes James I of England when the Queen finally dies. So we don't know. And perhaps at that time Harboth itself will cease to be the great fortress it has always been. Perhaps locals will build later farm buildings against the walls and use the walls as a quarry to mine for stone to build their houses, their peaceful houses, their farmhouses and houses in the village. And the whole era of the great border wars will simply pass into memory. But I'll just commend to you, if I may, there is a gun port you can see in the keep. You can see that wide mouth, which as I mentioned was, a, was a, a, an opening from which you could discharge firearms. You could discharge firearms against Scots who were attacking the gate, or indeed, even if they had breached the gate, and were inside the inner courtyard. But now, of course, the guns have all gone silent, 
the bows are put away and the old days of the border wars will simply fade away into memory and the story of ballads and poets. More recently, however, or so I believe, this place has been assaulted, but peacefully assaulted, by archaeologists, those who are desperate to unearth and tease out the secrets of the past. Hi, I'm Bev, um, and I'm a reenactor. And back in the day, you know, it would have been 99, I dug here with Newcastle University. Um, we did one. It, well, I, I only dug for one season here, but it was the end of quite a few seasons of work. And this is where I cut my archaeological teeth. It was um, in the gatehouse here. You can see there where part of the lining's been left from when the place was backfilled. It was tremendous fun. There were some really interesting things came out. A lot of well a lot of sheep teeth actually <laughs> i was um around here the, there was one area that were found where the, there was a been a significant burning incident and a lot of sheep teeth in that and i think we decided that was uh i think we decided that was robert the bruce's slap up barbecue after they'd uh, finished laying siege to the place i was here when there's a gold earring came out of the ground i would love to know what became of that uh, it's, I believe it, it is in one of the museums in Newcastle. I can't offhand remember which, but it was small gold, high enough status that, in in this again, the style was Tudor. It had to have been Margaret. Well, we think it had to have been Margaret Tudor or one of our ladies uh, holding something like that in your hand and being one of the first people to see it come out of the ground after 500 years, it's an absolutely incredible feeling. Another thing that I mean, I, I found personally, as we took the gatehouse down through several, uh, several levels, removed all this, uh, all the earth from inside there, there was a niche and it was small sort of, you know, point top, like a, like a church window sort of niche that would have been far, a candle. It had popped a candle in there in the wall, and that was, you know, that that was your, your bit of lighting. There was still candle wax in the bottom of that. Again, to touch that after so many years, who was the last person to light that candle? Who lit the bottom, stuck it in place, and lit it? Who was the who was the last person to do that? Who was the last person to extinguish it? as they left the castle. It's, th things like that are just, it, it is absolutely incredible. With archaeology, I mean, you are actually touching the past and bringing it to life. Uh, it's a real privilege. And I know um, there haven't been any excavations here for a while, but it was a privilege to have been involved with that. And it's something that I'll, though it was um, 20 odd years ago, <laughs> it's something that I'll never forget. Who are you? I'm John's wife. And Marjorie, how long have you been married to John? 70 years. And um, what's your memory about the castle? Well, the children liked and uh, we've got a few children and they've all enjoyed being brought up on it. Down the castle and the river. It's a beautiful area. It is. Never tired of it. He worked on the open cast. The open uh, cast mine? Yeah. And he um, had lodgings in a, my mother's house. And that's how I met him. And what did he do at the open cast mine? He drove a great big tractor. What did you think of John when you first set eyes on him? I didn't like him. What changed your mind? Oh, I got used to him. <laughs> Chicken <Cheeky> monkey. <laughs> and um, has it been a wonderful place to bring up the family in Harbottle? Yes. Wouldn't have changed it.
We've lived in two or three houses here. They, each one got better. And uh, have your children stayed around the area? Three of them. And one in Gosford. And uh, one down in Worcestershire. That's where she is now. And is this a very special place for them to come back to? Oh yes. Is there anything else you'd like to tell me about the castle or about John? I think I've said enough about him. Um. <laughs> you look a fantastic couple. Uh. You look a very handsome couple together. Ooh. John Common of Harbour. And John, John, you own you own the castle. I do. No. Uh -huh. When did you buy it? Oh, it's a few years ago now. Why did you want to buy it, John? Oh, uh, the castle. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, it's uh, nice to own something like a castle, or uh, you know, it was worth buying. Were you born in the village, John? No. Where were you born? Uh, Rothbury. When you came to the village, how many people lived here? Well, there wasn't the houses then. No, this house has been built over the years, you know. And uh, it wasn't a very big village years ago. And you knew everybody in it, you know. And, People who lived in the village, they, were, they all had like jobs, you know, like gamekeepers and things like that, you know. How old are you now, John? 94, I think. 94. 94. Why do you think it's important to keep, to look after the castle? Well, there's, there's a lot of history with the castle, you know go back a lot of years when it was a, a real castle, you know. There was, uh, it was a fight against the Scotch, you know, and it'd be important. It's an important bit of history for people to pass on to others. Oh, it is, aye. So, mm -hmm. What's your happiest memory of living in Harbottle, John? Yeah, well, it was it was a grand feeling living in Harbour. Mm -hmm. A real community. Pardon? A real community. Oh, I named it, yes. Yeah. John, I understand that there's a secret tunnel at the castle. Yes, there was one. It'll still be there, but it's uh, the occupants of the castle, if they went away, they went in this tunnel and they came out well down and it was a big tunnel they could lead a horse down and then when they got to the end of the tunnel when they come out they jumped on the horse and took off. Will you tell me where the tunnel is John? No, it's a secret. What's the best thing about the castle John? Well, because I bought it cheap. <laughs>